I'm humbled at the invitation uh, that Angelo State University has given me to be here tonight and talk about Pancho Villa. <laughs> so I guess without further ado, we can begin. And so a lot of the images that you'll see tonight are, they're from everywhere curated. I, I, I hope you have fun. And, and if, especially if you have questions, make sure you ask them. I love talking about Villa. Yes, uh, d definitely. So let's let, let me begin. So the oh, too much, too much. There. The way I approach Villa is through pop culture. Why? Because there's a biography this thick, <laughs> written by a uh, Frederick Katz, that talks about Villa as a in the biography. So I've always been fascinated by Villa. I'm from Durango. And so when I grew up, it says Durango and Villa are interconnected. But then when I, as I grew up and I became a historian, I, I figured out that that wasn't the case always. So that's where my passion for Villa started, to understand why Villa became so famous after his death. And so this is, that's kind of what prompted my entire research and for now my, my career. So the way I look at Villa is through different mediums. How? My, my idea is, if you look at Villa, so the Villa we, look, we, we see today is, is, is really hard to recreate from a historical perspective, right? Because there's so many stories and we can go through rabbit holes of like historical inaccuracies and all that. That's fine. Instead of doing that, the way I look at Villa is he's like, he's a mosaic. So we need different little pieces of, of mosaic to put together to get a historical understanding of the, of Villa, the, the, the figure, right, the, the, the man. So by looking at the myth and the legend, we, I piece together a different medium, which I'll share this evening with you, regarding a, a much clearer picture, hopefully, right, of Villa. So with, uh, all these mediums are in intercommunication with each other, and so there is overlap for sure, but that's kind of the, the, the thesis behind what I'm talking to you tonight, right? The different mediums that I'm going to, to examine here all make up little pieces of, of a bigger mosaic that help us visualize Villa. And so that's the, uh, these, are, these are some of the mediums that we're gonna talk about tonight. So, let's see. First, a uh, context of the man, Doroteo Arango, so not even Villa, right? So Doroteo Arango was born in, in a little hut uh, close to the uh, capital of Durango in San Juan de Rio in, on June 5th, uh, 1878. And the reason why his name was Jose Doroteo Arango was because he was born on, Doro, on Do, San Doroteo Day. And, that, and that's typical, like back in the day, depending on the day you were born, that's the day, your saint day, that's the name you would get. So that's why he's Jose Doroteo Arango. But, you know, he, there's a very, there's a mythical, well, there's a legend that B accounts that one day when he's around the age of 13, 14, he comes back home and he sees the, the local hacendado, the local landowner, trying to take his sister away. Um, and then he defends his honor by, by wounding the landowner and then go escaping to the, to the mountains. That's, Villa tells that story again and again. So, it, and it's a, very, it, it's a foundational myth, right? Is there any proof? We, we, we don't know. But Villa will, will retell that story time and time again. And that's the explanation for why he becomes what he will present himself as a social bandit, right? Social bandit, kind of the Robin Hood figure, it, the, the Robin Hood figure type, right? So that's kind of the social banditry of Robin Hood. Um, the reality is, you know, after that incident, he, uh, he lives a little bit in Durango, then he goes up to, to Chihuahua, and then there, there are stories that have him uh, working in ranching, working in mining, working as a albañil, so in construction, work uh, moving um, silver shipments from the Sierra down to, the, to, to Chihuahua City. So he's doing a lot of different jobs. Um, and then the revolution comes, and that's where we, we insert the, uh, you know, again, the, the el personaje histórico, the, the, the historical figure. Why this, why this is relevant is because, uh, again, he portrays himself as a social bandit. But when you take a look at like primary sources, there really isn't a whole lot of him prior to 1910. So I, I think he is, he's working all these different jobs and making, he's making networks throughout Chihuahua which will help him later on during the revolution. 
So the <clears throat> uh, Madero's top recruiter, Abraham Gonzalez, approaches him and says, look, there, there's gonna be a revolution. We need men like you, and Villa decides to join. And that's how Villa joins the revolution. He is one of the, he is one of the first men to um, you know, rise up against the Porfiriato on, on, on November 20th, 1910. Um, and it starts like a little, you know, the revolution starts like a little snowball that is growing and growing and growing. So by the uh, spring of 1911, it's, it's snowballed. They've taken over a small section of like next to Chihuahua, and so they take over Chihuahua in May of 1911, and everybody's happy. Um, so that's kind of the first stage here. So Villa is part of this initial you know, group of men that is, he's really good at recruiting men, right? At, at recruiting disenfranchised individuals that are against the, the, the current system before Firiato. And so they, they take over Ciudad Juarez, everything is like, every, everybody's happy. He goes into retirement, he opens up a butcher shop. So t the other thing he was, is he was a butcher. Um, so he, 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 he knew how to cut, cut meat up. Um, and there's a, he took advantage of that. There, there are primary sources. He, he, he put an ad in the paper. He was like, yeah, come to my butcher shop and we're, I can sell you some meat. Um, so that's the man. That he's a butcher. He's, he does everything. Um, the next phase is this, um, you know, he starts, like, so this picture is from, from uh, April of 1911. So, you know, you, you can see via here, it's like just guns blazing. He's ready to go. It's, it's not a clean image of Villa, and we'll see that later, a little bit later when, when I show you the film section. So that's Villa 1911. The next, the next stage is um, Madero gets assassinated, right? The, the, his boss basically gets assassinated in 1913. Villa, who was in jail for something different, escapes Mexico City, um, makes it to Tucson, makes it to, to El Paso, and then he finds out that Madero has been assassinated. He crosses the border with like six, six to eight men. And it's like, we're gonna take Mexico. And for the next two years, he basically takes Mexico. Uh, he's really efficient at recruiting men. Why? Why? Because in Chihuahua, there's a split between Maderistas and people that are loyal to Pascual Orozco and then in Villa. So because of the assassination of Madero, a lot of supporters uh, follow Pascual Orozco. And those that don't like Pascual Orozco, when Villa comes back into Chihuahua, they're like, oh, we, we support you, right? So that's one of the things that I look in, like when we look at the man, if he were a renowned bandit, as a community, why would you take him as your leader, right? So instead of considering Villa as a like, renowned bandit, I, th I think he, he, was, he was very well connected to all the different communities throughout Chihuahua. And that's what allowed him to be the leader of the revolution in Chihuahua and push down and take over Mexico from Victor and Huerta. Of course, I'm simplifying a lot of things here, but uh, that's the, the, the third phase. Sorry, the second phase. The, the third phase is, you know, they, uh, they take over Mexico. There are two factions. These two factions will fight each other in the battles of, of, of Celaya. Villa will not win these battles. And he has to retreat back to Chihuahua. Right? And so back in Chihuahua, he tries an expedition to Sonora, neighboring Sonora. It doesn't work. Um, and then he goes back to Chihuahua, and so what, like, what's next, right? So the next stage is this like 1916 to 1920 stage where you have the punitive expedition. So he attacks Columbus, New Mexico, the punitive expedition gets, you know, the U.S. gets super angry, sends Blackjack Persian to, to try to follow, you know, um, capture him, fails miserably, goes, comes back to the United States, and for the next three years, they're, they're guerrilla warfare, right? They're, they're up in the mountains, fighting, resisting, and in 1920, there's a change in government that allows him to, to settle with the government. And he's given an hacienda, and you know, his men are, are, are distributed, um, they're given land, and you know, Villa kind of retires for, for intents and purposes. He is able to set in motion his own idea of what the revolution is, which are military colonies, right? You, you work in the fields, and then the, in the afternoons you go to you go to school to, to learn how to read and write. Villa was very uh, keen in terms of you know everybody deserves uh, everybody deserves the right to, to to try to make it right. So the first thing is education. You have to be educated. You know you need to know how to read and write. And then the second is you know you you, you have you you 
you should have access to land to be able to work it and, and, and you know, make a, make a living off, off the land. So he gets assassinated in July of, of 1923, and this is the 100th year anniversary of that happening. And that's kind of the, like, that's where the, you know, the man, the, the, the figure, you know, ends, for, for at least for now. There is an incident, there is an incident um, in, in 26, somebody opens up the grave of Villa and decapitates the body. So even to this day, like, we don't know where the, where the head is. So if, ever, if anybody ever offers you a head, uh, it might be worth millions, though, <laughs> to the right people. Um, so now let's take a look at a, a little bit of, of media. So the first media is newspapers, political cartoons. These, this, this, this is from the time frame, right? So 19 teens. Yep, this. This, the first, the first media I look at is, is newspaper, but also in political cartoons. So this is um, April, so th th that picture, right? You, you, we saw the via in April of 1911. Um, this is the first famous picture. Of course, the most, one of the most famous picture is him riding in Okinawa in January of 14, right? This is December of 13, so it, we're, 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 we're not there yet, but this is the most famous picture prior to the Okinawa picture. And so that picture gets highlighted in December of 1913 by Leslie's, which is you know, a big deal, right? No revolutionary gets this type of spotlight. So what does this say? It says that little by little, he's building a, a following, not only in Mexico, but in the United States by you know, both US and, and, and Mexicano media. So like, Leslie, this magazine is a big thing. Um, but then we can con contrast that to this image, Stowe Leslie's, right? March of 1916. This is in, like, so Villa has just attacked uh, Columbus, and so this is, you know, Villa's now a bullseye, right? So you see how through different media, through, 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 sorry, through the same media, Villa can get depicted in, in various ways, depending on the time, on, on the time in the, depending on the year, right? So 19, 1913, 1912, he's like, Bia, yay. 1916, he's like, Bia, boo, right? That's kind of the, the idea. And then this cartoon from Life Magazine from March of 1917, so a year after the Pins of Expedition, right? Uh, or a year after Columbus raided, uh, Bia raided Columbus, it's like, it's the, uh, the Pins of Expedition leaves in January and it's, they're, they've got, they're gonna done with Bia. Um, and you see this is like making fun of the US for not capturing Villa, right? Villa has, has basically been able to escape unharmed and he is now uh, you know, enjoying the loot. So there, there's, this, is, this, this is one of those like images. So it, it's, it's a criticism of Villa but also criticism of the United States for not capturing him. So you see how the image of Villa is being utilized in different, in different ways. Still same magazines but different ways. These are political cartoons from, the, from 1916 regarding the Pinto Expedition. So let's take a look at these, right? So the first one is March 1916. The second one is also March 1916. And there's, there's hope in these cartoons, right? They're like, we're gonna capture Villa. It's, it's a matter of, 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 of days, hours, months. Like, it's, it's this close to capturing Villa. Right? As, the, as the time is progressing, and I think these are March, still March, still March, right? You know, who said the Americans couldn't fight? So it, it, there's so much hope that V is going to be captured within like, like you know, in a matter of, of, of moments that it starts getting tiring. So as the period of expedition, so the period of expedition crosses into Chihuahua. It sets up shop in Colonia Dublan, which is more or less northern, central northern Chihuahua. And they, they will launch an expedition. The further south, south they go is Parral Chihuahua, I believe. Um, and that's pretty much it, right? There, there were calls for, like, let's invade Mexico. It's like, well, we probably don't wanna do that, but there, there's hope here. But then as you start seeing April, there's like, okay, we're here. Where's Villa? We can't find him, right? Like, so that's, the narrative code goes from, hey, we're gonna find Villa, they're like, okay, we don't, we, where is he? We're like, I don't wanna, we don't know where he is. Um, and we don't even know if he's alive or dead, right? This cartoon I love because Via is looking at Uncle Sam, and Uncle Sam is giving, being given bad directions, and it's kind of what happens, actually. So the, the historical reality is, after the attack on Columbus, Via uh, rides 
to, to the Sierra, he gets wounded, and for the next five months, he's recuperating in a cave, and only two people know where he is, um, two, two of his soldiers, and Villa, that's it. Nobody knows where he is. And he tells his followers, hey, if they ask, tell them I'm dead. Like, that's it. And there's a lot of speculation as to like, okay, yeah, Villa's dead, and they're, they're opening up graves, and it's like, oh, this is, this is in Villa? And so for the next, like, three months, everybody can't find the grave. They're finding, the, instead of finding Villa, they're trying to find the grave site of Villa. And so these cartoons are, are alluding to that. This cartoon is much more elaborative in its discussion of Villa, but it's actually like pretty accurate, even though they, they don't know, they really don't know what's happening, they really do capture what's happening. It's like Villa's hiding and then Villa is awake, sorry, we, Villa pops up. So after Villa uh, gets better from his leg wound, he, he will actually capture Chihuahua City in September of 1916. Um, almost, that, uh, he gives a grito, the independence, you know, they celebrate Independence Day in, in Chihuahua City. And then they, he, he, he goes back to the mountains. But all this to say, right, Villa is being portrayed in different ways through this media. Um, by October, as the uh, October cartoon shows here, which is in, in Por Dios Pancho, que no ves que estoy luchando por ver, pero, que no, que no ves que estoy luchando por ver quien se queda con el estandarte del triunfo? Like, what does that mean? It means that Uncle Sam is tired of looking for Villa. He, he's much more focused and interested in knowing who's going to win the World Series than in finding Villa, right? That's the, that's the shift. So it's like we're, do, we're done with Villa, but he's still there, but like, I just, we just want to focus our, our, our efforts on something else. So, so that's, the, that, that's 1916. And then the, uh, this cartoon is like, okay, they're really much, they're on to other imperial, imperial invasions, you know, and, and Zapata and Villa are just you know, laughing in the background because they, the, 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 the European expedition was not able to capture Villa. They were able to disband a lot of Vista groups, but not capture Villa, right? So there's a different narrative, right? There's hope in the beginning, and then at the end, it's like, just dude, just let me watch my game. Another, another medium of this time frame are um, dime novels. So these are two different dime novels. The first one is Boy Scouts. It's part of a bigger series of Boy Scouts. And the other one is from 1916. I'll, I'll talk briefly about these. So, 1913, you, you, you have some uh, uh, Boy Scouts that, that go into Chihuahua looking for Villa. Because, according to the story, his unc uh, the, the uncle of one of the, of, of, of one of the boys owns cattle in Chihuahua, and they want to go talk to Villa. Because, but, so they find Villa, and Villa is like, yeah, I've been taking care of this cattle for your uncle, Here's the money, and then they go back. They're happy, so it, it's a really like happy encounter, right? 1916. You see, there's a body there in the frame of the horse, and so it's like it's a completely different narrative, right? Because it's a different time frame. So Villa is the bandit or the tiger of Mexico, as he gets he gets called the tiger of Mexico here, and it's a it's a biography that it's not really a biography. It's just a let me tell you how bad Villa can be, but it's. It's not historically accurate. They're, it's a dime novel, so people are just writing whatever they want about Villa. So it's, it's like positive portrayal in 1913, negative portrayal in 1916. The same media, right? It's th these are dime novels. So th this is th this is one of those examples um, of Villa just being portrayed in media. And then as, this is a picture of him in in a, in a Mexican newspaper in Canutillo in, in like 1920. 21, 22, before he's, he's assassinated. So he's, he's, he's playing pickleball. That's what he did, that's what he did in retirement. He, he, he worked in the fields, he played pickleball, he, took a, uh, he, took, um, he, he swam, and at night he would go to the school to learn how to read and write. Although he, he knew how to read and write, just he wanted to get better at it. He, he was really good at reading. Um, and then, so one of, the, one of the big myths that exist about Villa is that he, he drank, he wasn't an alcoholic. He didn't drink, no alcohol. He was a teetotaler, because for whatever reason, he, he was just, I think he was a progressive in many ways, like, like progressive not wanting to drink. He, be a, I think, was, um, he just didn't believe in drinking. He believed that it was, a, it made his men, you know, men could do other things with their abilities as opposed to drink. What's funny about this story is, in the 1970s, a tequila company, was created called the Pancho Villa Tequila Company. And so one of the things that they did was they, they're the cantor, so they're bottles with different 
scenes of Via. One bottle features Via standing up, and the way to access the liquor is by decapitating Via. You take out, the, so you remove the head, and then you drink the liquor that's inside. So, right, that's it, it, so it's like, wait a minute, he's a teetotaler, it makes no sense. And then you have to decapitate the, it's like, ugh, so many, so many weird things here happening. Um, but yes, that's, that's example, that's example of like, you have the man, and then you have the, how is he represented through these different mediums. So this is him playing Pelota Vasca, pickleball. Then, of course, the assassination happens, and this is from the funerary procession as they're taking the body to being buried, to be buried in, um, in, this, in the local cemetery, Parral. I, the, reason, the reason why I have this image today is because today, nowadays, uh, for the last 20 years, they reenact this every July 20th in Parral, Chihuahua. So they reenact the assassination, which also, like, okay, so he was, he was driving a Dodge Brothers car, not a, not a Ford. And when they do the recreation, they're driving a Ford. And they're always like, you're driving a Ford, it's not a Ford, it's a Dodge Brothers. But, you know, that's, that's, me, that's a historian in me. <laughs> So they do the reenactment, and then they, they take the body, they actually do the wake at the same uh, hotel he was, he, was, um, he was put in, and then they take the body to the cemetery. They recreate this scene every year in July 20th. So if you want to go to Parral, the Jordas Vistas, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool tourist attraction. And then of course, now we, we, we go into Corrido, right? So this is the Corrido uh, del Asesinato de Pancho Villa, and this is another medium that I look at. Uh, so I also look at songs. And so before I get into songs, these are two op-ed pieces from the New York Times, one of them, and the Los Angeles Times, that talk about him now, he's a martyr because of the assassination. And so despite the negative press that Villa got in the latter period, they're still talking about him. You know, like if, he were, if he was only educated enough, he would have been president of Mexico. So even in the US, his portrayal, despite the punitive expedition, is a, a balanced one, right? So that's one of the, again, different, different media have different portrayals of Via in different time frames. So now we, we can move on to, to another uh, source, which are corridos, uh, songs. So not only, of the, in, not only in Mexico, which are corridos, folk songs, but also in the United States. So one of the, so this is a, a cover sheet for uh, On the Road to Mexico, uh, they're using Dixieland for the, song, for the basis of the song. And the, the, you, you can sing along with the, with the song sheet. So this is something that people in the period of expedition, 1916, 1917, would have been able to purchase and sing as they were marching down to Mexico. Going back to the cave, there is a story that says that the, the period of expedition got really close to finding the cave Villa was because the Villistas tell a story that at, one, at some point during the Pacific Expedition, they could hear soldiers singing on the road to Tiberi. So the soldiers were like singing, it, it kind of, it's, it's not intuitive, but it's like they're singing on the way to try to find somebody that's hiding. So, but there was like, then they, they butcher the name, but it's like, it's pretty sure they were singing the, on the road to Tiberi, which would have been one of the songs used in this time frame. So, you know, song is a very powerful thing. Um, just a plug-in for the collections here because I, I, I had a really fun time today. And uh, the, you have a Pancho Villa collection, so you know, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, so one of the, the digital part is the airplane. So there's, a, there's punitive expedition pictures here. And so the one in the background is of a plane, right? And then we have that image, which is the uh, Villistas entering Guadalajara, uh, probably 1914. One of the things, so we have the, uh, and, and so this is the song section. So we have the uh, songs, and then this movie from uh, 1968, like Via Ride. He, it's, Via is not here, it's Bronson. But they have a, a scene where he has to fly in the plane. Bronson has to fly in the plane. He's horrified about it. So why, why I'm giving you this song is because I'm going to show you uh, a clip or, uh, of a song. Try to try to follow the lyrics.
Right, the song is talking about, you know, via, at the, at the end of the song, which is the section I wanted to show you, right, via is at the end of, the, he's flying, he's flying in the plane saying goodbye to the gringos as they're trying to find him. So, of course, that, it's not historically accurate, that didn't happen, but the sheer idea, the sheer romanticism of this happening is, is, is fascinating, right? And it, this is where we get to, you know, like film is one of those mediums that helps perpetuate some of these legends and myths, right? And so this is one of the things that I, I really, find interesting about pop culture. Most of, the, most of us get our, our historical facts from pop culture through corridos, movies, other mediums, right? And so this is where like, I've talked to people and like, but Villa was this and that. And I'm like, I know where you're getting it from, but historically, maybe, not, it's, maybe it's not accurate. So this is a, a good example. Um, of course, the phenomenon of Villa, and so one of the most famous songs, La Cucaracha, Right, is a beast, a song, but you can also, this song is like, this song is a really old, it's an older song, so there are both lyrics for Vista lyrics, there are both, you know, there are lyrics for anti-Vista anti -vista lyrics, everybody, everybody owns this song, and they, they sing it according to their own desire. This song became really famous because in the 1920s, I was taught to, to um, kids at schools, but also because in 34, the, the movie Viva Villa featuring Wallace Berry was very, very popular. So the movie was created, and this is, now we're bordering film, right? The movie was created by MGM, um, and it was, it was you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting portrayal of Villa, right? In, in one sense, they're, they're trying to portray him as, it, he's, in the movie, he's portrayed as a drunkard sometimes, and a, and a womanizer, which I'll give him that, he was a womanizer. Um, so it's like kind of clumsy, I almost like greaser image of Via, but um, the the movie like takes off. It's so famous that this movie has uh, it, it films in, in it's it screens in Europe. Uh, Wasbury will get recognized in Venice. He'll he'll be given um, an award by Benito Mussolini himself. Like fascists like uh, like eat this movie up. Like um, Goebbels uh, Goebbels talked about the movie being like Hitler, one of Hitler's favorite movies. But at the same time, like we couldn't show it in Germany because it was like too revolutionary. And then on the other side, you know, as the as the civil war was raging on in Spain, um, uh, there were battalions in honor of Villa that would go into battle singing La Cucaracha because of this movie, right? This like this entire thing. So this movie fits in kind of the uh, Western, you know, Western genre. There's kind of a subsection like Western revolutionary genre. So. In, in one way or another, this is the a perspective on like what will be spaghetti westerns. So this is like one of, and this is one of those movies that is spearheading the spaghetti spaghetti western movie, movement of the '60s. So that's this is to, to many Europeans, this is the first image of Via, not the man, but the figure that is coming out of the movie, right? And then this other movie, this is um, Viva Via, this is. Um, they would send the, 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 these promo sheets. So this is a promo sheet from Europe uh, that explains how to promote the movie. This is from France, if I'm not, yes, from France, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so now we move into Villa in film, right? So I talked a little bit about Viva Villa, was very uh, a U.S. production. Uh, and this is Villa, right? Villa, remember Villa 1911? He looks ready to go fight. This is, he's wearing a uniform provided by the Mutual Film Corporation. So Villa is... So as the revolution is going on in Mexico, 
he is, he is, you know, 1913, he's like, oh, Villa, Villa can even be president of Mexico, right? The Woodrow Wilson administration sees him as being a possible, you know, to take over the country and, and, and rule over Mexico. Film corporations also, also take notice and they will go down to Mexico and one film, one film company will, will make a movie of him. And, and that's the premise for the 2003 movie starting himself, uh, and starring himself as Pancho Villa, starring uh, Antonio Banderas. If you've ever seen that movie, that's a movie about the movie. Uh, <laughs> and it, so, but the, the cool thing is Villa plays himself in some sections of the movie at, at the latter part. Of course, this is one of those things. If you ever find the, the original like 1914 movie, it is worth, a, it, no, it's, a, it's a lost movie. So nobody knows, it, it just, back in the 19-teens, you would return the movies back and they would get destroyed. This movie does not exist. Uh, there, there's a famous Mexican scholar that, that found pieces of the movie in El Paso. But the entire movie itself, The Life of Pancho Villa, did not, doesn't exist right now. It was screened in New York, again, throughout the United States and Europe. It was a very famous movie. And so Villa was very keen. I think Villa was very keen in knowing how to present himself up until he, he the punitive expedition. So he's very keen in terms of like media, what we, we would call today social media. He knows how to present himself. So this is Villa in, in a general uniform provided by the Mutual Film Corporation. And so these movies, right, again, in Mexico, the first movie is mid-1930s, Vámonos con Pancho Villa, and the other one is 1960s, Así es, Así es Pancho Villa. They both portray Villa differently. So in the 1930s movies, movie, Villa is, there's more emphasis placed on the Villistas, the soldiers of Villa, and, and Villa is kind of this ambiguous figure. In the other movie, in the Asiera Pancho Villa, first of all, starts Brother Mandaris, who is a big figure in Mexican cinema. He's, you know, Villa is the central figure now. And he, even if he kills somebody, there's a, there's a justification for killing him. I'm like, oh, he was going to betray you anyway. Right? So there's a, again, there's a different portrayal on, on Villa in the 30s as opposed to the 60s. And I'll explain a little bit why. But it, movies are, are one of those things. And then in the United States, as I mentioned, right, we have Wallace Berry. And you can see, right, a very characteristic, cartoonish almost figure of Villa, whereas a much more somber uh, Antonio Banderas in 2003 um, HBO production. This is just a plug-in for, um, the, the Villa movies are, 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 they're shown throughout the United States. This is a little theater in, in Nebraska. And so as part of the movie ticket, so what, what I have here is a movie ticket for this theater in Nebraska. It's about a, one, a, a Villa movie, right, Dead or Alive, uh, 19, this movie would, would have come out in 19, uh, 19, late 1920s. And so the cool thing about the, movie, the, the ticket is if you, if you turn around the ticket, there is a, a wax figure that accompanied this movie set, this movie production. So after the movie, you would see a, a wax, a, a, a life-size wax figure of Villa and his, and his horse, Siete Leguas. And this is like in the middle, this is like the, the middle of the United States, and this tour, this, this movie is, being shown throughout the United States. So there's a fascination with Mexico and the West, right? Um, so that's, that theory is still there. Another media is uh, um, comic books. And so comic books, you know, he is one of those like figures that are so controversial that he sells. And so he will find himself in, in cartoon, in, sorry, comic books. And so here are some examples of comic books, right? In the United States and in Mexico. There's a different portrayal of Villa. The, 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 the a little bit more fantastic in the um, United States and a little bit more somber. Let me give you a biography of Villa in, in Mexico. But these comic books are 19, you start seeing, um, cart not cartoons, but comic strips in, as early as 1930s. And then really the 1950s onward, that's when you see Villa cart uh, comic books. And I, 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 as I tell students, I have an eBay budget so I hoard comic books. And so every, like, I go on eBay, it's like, Pancho Villa. It's like, oh, that's a, that's a comic book I don't have. So I have, a, I have a running collection from the 1950s to 2000s of Pancho Villa comic books. So they're, they're, they're fascinating to take a look at. These are just some examples of different Pancho Villa comic books. These are from the 60s, I believe. Um, also from the 60s. These are, early, I think, 70s. These are 2000s. So you can see a different image of, like, again, you know, you can read the stories inside, and there, he, he becomes much more, he becomes more heroic as the decades are progressing. That's via in comic books. Um, 
I'll give you a, a very interesting comic book that is a Pancho Villa comic book that was produced in England. So as you can read here, in um, 43 to, what, 43 to, to 1966, this company, or in England, they, 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 they didn't import stuff, or at least for print, some print media. So they decided to go on their own, like, hey, what do we want to print? We're gonna, we want to make comic books of Pancho Villa. So there's a series from the 1950s, 60s of Pancho Villa comic books that make, if you take a look at them, right, Pancho Villa does not look like Pancho Villa. He looks like Branson from the 1968 movie. And this is the interior of one of those movies, right? Pancho Villa in the tropical paradise of Mexico. Again, Pancho Villa is operating in Chihuahua, Durango. Doesn't look like this, right? This looks like Jalisco, the coastline, Nayarit, you know, Mazatlan. This, this does not look like Chihuahua. Yet he is fighting, you know, native indigenous people, which again, the indigenous people in Mexico do not look like this. So this is right, this is a perception, an English perception on a historical figure and then the, a romantic version of like what people look like and what Latin America looks like. Again, to, why is this important? Because this is how people outside of Mexico perceive Mexico and perceive Villa, right? This swashbuckling, <clears throat> you know, almost, again, Robin Hood figure. And it's, as you can see, right, the Robin Hood of Mexico. So that's how you get the, all these different narratives and stories are coming out of elements like this in pop culture. This is a, so this is now, we're, we're talking about Villa and statues. Um, and so this is another comic book, but, you know, it's still, let's talk about Villa and statues. So the, the last section of this, or last segment, is the actual historic, like more of a historical narrative, right? We, we, we've gone through pop culture, but another way of looking at Via is through need, uh, statues. Well, why is this important? Because Via is assassinated in 23, and the, and the, the faction that, that wins the revolution or is in power will, they, they will invest some time in, in, in trying to forget Villa, right? So this is also one of those important things. Villa is not, in the big, like 1920s, 30s, Villa is not one of the prominent revolutionaries of Mexico. He's like, Villa who? That's, you know, it's, it's, a, process, it's a historical process to recover the, the memory of Villa. This is why you don't really have pop culture elements in the 30s and you start seeing them in the 40s, right? Because in the 20s, there really isn't. So um, I took a look at like uh, November 20th celebrations from the, like 25 all the way to 68, and Villa does not, he's not figured in, in like the first 10 years, no mention of Villa whatsoever. It's like, it's Carranza, it's um, Plutarco Elias Calles, it's Abel Obregón, they, they are the, th the three major ones. It's really only after the exile of Plutarco Elias Calles and with, under the Cardenas administration that now you have Villistas I mean, they've, they've always been Villista, but it's like, okay, this is our moment to, to, to rescue the historical figure of Villa, our, our former leader, right? So the first statue, this is why the first statue to Villa goes up in 38 in Ciudad Lerdo, because Villistas petitioned the government of Lázaro Cárdenas, hey, can we get a statue? And, Car and Cárdenas is like, you know what, this, yeah, you can get a statue. This really, this actually helps me because we're trying to unify the different factions of the, you know, the, that fought in the revolution, so we're all, we're all this big revolutionary family. So this really helps Cardenas uh, out, and this helps Vistas out because it's now it's like, okay, we have our foot in the door. Now we can start asking for things, right? The other, the other thing that Cardenas does is he gives a general pardon to anybody that had at some point or another fought, you know, against the government. So Vistas are in, in that list. Um, so he gives a general pardon. He recognizes Villa as a general of the revolution, and he allows for the statue to go up in Ciudad Lerdo. So the, the Cardenas administration is a really important moment for Villistas, because now Villistas can be Villistas, right? They, they, can, they can not worship their leader, but they like, we, we can be Villistas now. It's not something that's against the government, per se. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, again, it's a very small process. So by the 19... 1950s, late 1950s, there's no statue of Villa in Mexico City. So what you have is veterans on a yearly basis um, that usually fall on, on Villa's birthday, which is June 5th, or the commemoration of the assassination in July 20th, they go to statues, this one, this statue is of Francisco Madero, and they have a little ephemeral mem you know, mem remembrance of Villa. 
So, and they've used, you know, as the time progresses, they play corridos, they, so, so they would have played, you know, they could have played the song that we just, that, that we just heard, among other corridos, that would have reinforced the sense of villismo, this pride of being a villista, right? So this is how different mediums are, are, are feeding off each other to remember Villa, the man that has been reinterpreted through different medium as, you know, the legend and the myth. Uh, these are other examples of um, I what I would call ephemeral remembrance as a via, right? Because there's no statue. There's only the pictorial evidence of this be, of this happening. And the other way of getting a, of getting um, evidence of this, like primary sources, are reading maybe the minutes or or may, like reading the festivity. Like they did this first, and then they did that first or second, right? It's usually it's like a, a speech and some corridos, and then they, they talk a little bit about Villa, and that's the, 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 the you know, the ceremony is ended. But you start seeing the, the you know, the, the messaging, right? Al general vencedor de la usurpación. So Villa now becomes the, this, this, the armed struggle of the revolution. He's the arm, he's the, the fighting force that defeated, you know, the foes of the revolution. That's, that's how he gets portrayed by the government. So it, again, it, it's, it's not coincidental how Villa gets portrayed. It is, it's a, it's a curated, negotiated effort to, to get to the Villa that we have today, right? And so, right, in the back and over there, you, you see PR, it's an I. So that's like, okay, the Partido Revolucionario Institucional has not co-opted, but he's like, okay, he's part of that, you know, fab, you know revolutionary family. He, we recognize him as such. He's not yet a pillar of it, but he's, he's working his way up, right? Or he's, until we get the statue. The statue goes up in, in 71, or in this, it's, I, 71, that's the, that's the statue in Mexico City. It is arguably one of the biggest statues. There are other statues that go up in Chihuahua, Durango, but you know, they finally achieved the statue. And nowadays, um, this is the statue that usually gets, um, Villistas in Mexico City go to the statue to, to again, worship via on, on his birthday or, or on the, Eve of, of his assassination. So the, he's now be, becoming part of the revolution, right? Or sorry, becoming part of the historical narrative of the, of the, of the government in Mexico. Um, and then this, this, um, this um, gentleman handing us with a, with a pendant is from uh, La Coyotada when they celebrated the 100th year anniversary of Villa's uh, birth. So they did an entire monument thing and the president went down to to visit and the culmination of all this is in the 70s when the government decides to move Villa's body from Parral to the Monument of the Revolution where Villa's remains are now in the same column that Francisco Madero's remains are. There are stories that that's not Villa's body, but again, does it matter? I, I, we can debate that, but that's the like, official narrative, the, the remains were, were moved to Mexico City and that, that where Villa, that's where Villa is. And then we see other like things, like so we're moving on to the the day-to-day -day objects, if you will. But this coin is a commemoration that features um, Madero, Carranza, Villa, Obregón, Calles. There's there's another one there that I can't remember off the top of my head. But this coin was this medallion was was commissioned by Diaz Ordaz. So again, this is like Villa has been incorporated by the late sixties into the the revolutionary family. And so that's an example of, you know, of, of things. So now we move into an assortment, a list of items that you can read, but it includes t-shirts, it includes keychains, it includes underwear, guacamole dips, um, tequila bottles, as I mentioned, Lego play sets, action figures, and of course, one of my favorite, I guess, would be uh, tattoos. I don't have a be a tattoo. But that's, that's just because of, I don't aspire to have a tattoo in, in general. But if I were to have a tattoo, it'd probably be a Via tattoo. Right. There's a conviction to, to, to getting a Via tattoo, right? So again, this is just one of those examples of belt buckles, definitely one of those things. Um, these are the, the, the tequila bottles I, I told you. So right, the, the tequila bottles right there. So they depict historical moments of Via. So Via sitting in the presidential chair is one of the big, you know, important pictures of the, uh, and so if you want the bottle, you can get the bottle. And there are like seven moments in Via history that get, you know, put in the bottles. Um, 
I, I've, I really haven't tasted the, the tequila in these bottles because they're 1970s, so I'm, I'm kind of scared of drinking one of these things. This is, so v, the other thing about Villa is to some people he's a saint, right? He's a saint. So you, you ask him for favors as you would ask a Catholic saint for favors. And so what's, what, I, what I find fascinating about this section, so this is a, uh, a vela to, to, to invoke a favor, and then the aroma of Pancho Villa, which I don't ask me how it smells, because I, I don't remember. One of my kids spread it once, and I'm like, no, no, you're going to let Villa spirit out. Stop it. That's one of those things. Um, yeah, so Villa, yes, Villa. The, the funny thing about Villa is, there are different mediums, so like people that, that um, the body of the, the, the spirit of Via goes into his body and talks to you. So you can, you can if you want to, you can con contact a, medi a medium and they can, they can summon Via for you and you can talk to Via about whatever you want to talk about. They only ask in return that you give them a cigarette and a bottle of tequila. Which again, it's like, wait a minute, but Via didn't drink. Why, why, would, you, why, would, the, why would the medium of Via ask for a bottle of tequila? So he's, he's a saint to some people, and he's venerated um, mostly in northern, northern parts of northern Mexico. Um, but it gets, it's one of those, like, he's so detached from the historical via that, first of all, he would have gotten a laugh out of it. All, he would have laughed his heart out uh, after, you know, knowing everything that he's become in, in the afterlife of via. But um, that's, um, yeah, we can all pray to via if, if you want. <laughs> that's it. Thank you.